taking a break for a morning and getting away from the business of life is good. But what we need, guys, what I need, I know it for sure. I need supernatural refreshment this morning. Like I need a touch from him and he's willing to do it. You know, one of God's attributes is, is omnipresence. And what that means is he's everywhere. And so he's here in this backyard where we are with all of us guys right here. He's at every location where every man is. And you know what? He's even in rooms where men are just by themselves in front of their computers. And his invitation for refreshment is the same for each one of us. He's here and he says, I'm waiting for you guys. I'm waiting for you, my sons, to come and spend some time with me. The question is, are, are we going to do it? The question is, will I actually take the time and quiet my own soul and quiet my own mind so that I could actually hear his voice this morning, that I could actually spend time in his presence and, and receive refreshment? One of my other favorite verses about this is in Matthew. Matthew kind of tells the same account that I just read in Mark. This is a verse familiar to many of you. In, in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and 29, Jesus says something very similar. He says, come to me, all, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And that idea of a yoke, a yoke was meant to bring together, right? Yeah. It's close, moving in the same direction. And that's what Jesus invites us to do this morning. He says, come close to me and receive the refreshment, receive the encouragement that I want to give you this morning. And so, guys, that's the challenge that, that I have for myself. I know I've had a really busy week, a busy month, a busy year. It's been really stressful. I was telling Dan, uh, we, we had some talks on the phone, haven't we, lately? Um, I need his refreshment. So that's his invitation to us, guys. It's his invitation to me. Will I quiet my soul? Will I quiet my mind? Will I accept his invitation this morning to refresh? So I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to pray a minute and, uh, and, and invite us to, but before I do, I just want to take a moment of silence where we would each have a, an opportunity to reflect on that, about where our own hearts are. And maybe ask him to do something this morning to provide refreshment. So would you guys join me in that a minute? Just, just close your eyes, each of us individually. It is good to just sit and be quiet in your presence, Father. To know that you're listening. To know that you hear me, that you hear each man, that you see my heart, that you see the heart of each man that's here this morning. Lord, you know what we're going through. We don't have to hide anything from you. <laughs> but how freeing that is to know that you're a loving and gracious and compassionate God. You invite us to come alongside you and experience your goodness and your grace, your care. Your love is so amazing. Father, would you draw us in this morning? Would you quiet our minds? Would you quiet our hearts? Would you quiet our souls so that we could rest and bask in your, in your grace? Would you refresh us today? Would you refresh me? I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, we, we asked you to bring a journal and a pen. I, I hope you did. Um, if you didn't, at your locations, maybe, maybe raise your hand. Your host team will get you something. But we're going to do something today. There's something powerful that happens when we do more than just think about something. Oftentimes, we hear something, and, and it resonates in our heart, and we go away, and, and we move on quickly. But 
there's something powerful that happens when we write it down. So this is our first little exercise in this. Grab your journal or a piece of paper right now, if you would, and just write down a couple of thoughts about what was going through your mind in that quiet time that we just took. Express your intentions to God. Maybe it starts with something like this. Father, I'm here. Would you dot, dot, dot? Would you, would you, would you talk to me today? Would you refresh my soul? So we're just going to take a moment right now and just write down a couple of sentences expressing your intention to God and expressing your, your openness to his invitation to refresh. Another thing we're going to do today is uh, we're going to share with each other a little bit, I hope. I hope you'll take that opportunity to do that. You know, a couple of things I just wrote down. You know, Father, I'm here. Would you refresh me? Would you heal me? Would you restore me? I need you. I need your presence. I need your power. I need your encouragement. So I'm I'm counting on him today, Dan, to show up. He always does. He does. He's faithful. Uh, so, men, the next thing we're going to do, we're going to worship a little bit. We're going to welcome him and his presence. Uh, Brenton's going to lead us in a time of worship. So I just encourage you, wherever you are, worship how the Spirit's leading you. If you want to stand and raise your hands, if you want to sit and be quiet and just listen, uh, worship. Let's worship the Lord together. Come on, Brenton. Son, God's only Son, perfectly spotless one. He never sinned, He never sinned, but suffered as if He did. All authority, all authority, every victory.
Jesus. Jesus, awesome and power forever. Awesome and great is your name. You overcame. Power in hand. Power in hand. Speaking the Father's plan. Sending us out. Sending us out. Light in this broken land. All authority. All authority. Every victory is yours. All authority. Every victory. Shadows of my soul. The work 
is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope, hallelujah, praise the one who sent me free, hallelujah, death and lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine such great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory. To wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. The beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. My living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. That made the silence, the roaring light. Declare the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning, came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave. Has no claim on me. Jesus, Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. That was good. That was really good. Mm. Oh. Uh, so, uh, guys, we, we have a great story coming up, and it's on forgiveness. You know, what I've, I've come to understand is, as we go through that wilderness, the same thing that dries us out, God flips it over hmm. and refreshes us. So think <laughs> of forgiveness in your life, those relationships you've had, 
and you have some bitterness or something, but when that comes back together and forgiveness occurs, it's a refreshment like no other. And uh, this week I'm, I'm in the book of Genesis, and it's one of the most classic forgiveness stories. It's Jacob, Jacob and Esau, right? Um, Jacob had stolen Esau's blessing, the older brother's blessing, and Esau was so mad he was going to kill his brother. Talk about a bitterness, a root of bitterness in a family. So Jacob takes off, running north, away from his brother. He's going to go live up there for years. Hiding behind his wives. Yeah. (laughs) So he's going to go up there for years until his brother cools off, and then he can come back, and hopefully his brother will forgive him. So he leaves his father's home. He leaves Isaac's home. But what's amazing in Scripture before that, Jacob would refer to God as my father's, as my dad's God, Hmm. Isaac's God. He would never refer to God as my God. So he's he's on the road. He's by himself running away from his brother who's trying to kill him. And he, he, he pulls over for the night. And, and he's in such a bad spot, he takes a rock and he uses it as a pillow. Think of that rock in your life right now. That's your pillow. That thing that's drying you out. And that's Jacob on the side of the road sleeping on a rock. And God gives him this amazing vision of heaven that night with his head on the rock. And this is what... Jacob says, this is what Jacob says when he wakes up. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He took that very rock that was under his head, giving him discomfort, that rock in his life, that unforgiveness. He now takes that rock out from under his head and he places it up as a pillar. He called the place place Bethel though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I may return safely to my father's house. Then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, Lord, I will give you a tenth. So that unforgiveness, that story of driving Jacob through the wilderness, laying on the rock, led him to go from God being his father's God to God being his God. And so it's just a beautiful story. The forgiveness has had not happened yet in that story. It's coming in a few chapters, and I can't wait to get there. But forgiveness in our lives, bitterness in our lives, can flip over and refresh us. I had a story in my own life in business there was a man who did just some awful things to me. I'd worked hard, done um, business, I thought, God's way. And uh, he came in, just turned everything upside down. And I was in a state of bitterness. I didn't know how to forgive this guy. I didn't know what to do, but he was eating me up. This guy owned me all day, every day, all night, couldn't sleep. I was bitter. And uh, so a Christian brother said, I think you should pray for him. So I did. I prayed for him. He was a private pilot, and I prayed that his carburetor and his airplane would plug up. <laughs> God didn't answer that prayer. So then that same brother said, well, maybe you should uh, you know, witness to him and, and lead him to the Lord. And I said, man, I am not going to spend eternity in heaven with that guy. No mm-hmm. way. Uh, but God had another plan. I just continued to seek the Lord. I continued to abide in his word. And uh, day went by, day by day, month by month, year by year. I think God started to heal my heart and forgive him. And I knew that someday I would find him somewhere. We would run, our paths would cross, and I always wondered how I would react. And finally that day happened. I'm walking in a parking lot one direction, and he's walking in a parking lot the other direction. There was nowhere nowhere I could go, and God just overwhelmed me with forgiveness. Hmm. And I put my hand out, and I said, John, how are you doing, brother? I haven't seen you for a long time. I hope things are well. And remember in the Bible where it says it's like keeping hot coals on someone's head, his eyes got so big and so scared. Hmm. It was crazy. But in my heart, I was totally content, had forgiven him, had moved past it, and God refreshed me that day. Just a beautiful story of of forgiveness that I got to enjoy and the refreshment uh, through that story. So he took a root of bitterness, flipped it right side up, Hmm. and refreshed me in forgiveness. So we have a great story of forgiveness today. Two guys... Uh, that are with us, and uh, we're going to play a video, and then they're going to 
uh, answer some questions, but these guys are amazing. Eddie Resendez is married to his high school sweetheart, Maribel. They have three adult children, uh, Aspen, who is a police officer, Ryan, a senior at Cal State, and their uh, youngest, Jacob, a sophomore at Fresno Pacific University. Eddie was raised in a small town of Lamont, California. Yeah. <laughs> Graduating from Arvin High School, he eventually moved to the big city of Bakersfield soon after. Eddie started his career with Coca-Cola and is now a realtor in Bakersfield. Eddie started his Christian walk in 2011 as, and has been on his personal journey with influencers ever since. His passion is sharing the love of Jesus Christ. Eddie knows that his personal gift is tapping men on the shoulder and sharing how God can transfer, transform or, er, and restore broken and lost men. And uh, with Eddie today is Ben Reese. Ben has been married to Patricia for seven years. I'll give you guys an inside tip. Never, ever, ever, ever believe Ben when he says to call his wife Patty. <laughs> Only call her Patricia, no matter what he says. They have two children, Jordan and Selah, who are 14 and 6. Ben is the owner of a biological company. He helps businesses navigate complex state and federal regulations. But Ben's passions are hunting and fishing and chasing the Lord and bringing as many people as possible on that journey with him. Ben appreciates free t-shirts and will wear the same shirt until holes appear. And a Patricia, Patricia, not Patty, throws it away. So anyways, listen to their story. Yeah, so uh, how I remember the story is I was in college. I was going to BC at the time. You, know, you go to parties, you go to this stuff, and there just happened to be a bar that was opening, like a grand opening, and everybody had fake IDs or whatever. So we walk in, and uh, and I was like, wow, like, this is this is crazy. Like, you can't even walk around. This is not even 85. So uh, about 25 years ago, uh, my friends and I, and along with my brother, went out to uh, to a bar in Bakersfield. Uh, my brother was underage, and uh, I was just about 21, 22 years old at the time. So upon arriving at the um, the bar, which was downtown, um, arriving there, you know, there's different different people from different sides of town, and uh, I noticed my brother. Uh, uh, somebody looked at my brother from across the uh, the bar, and I could tell my brother was getting agitated from it. And so he starts talking to me, he's like, hey, Eddie, there's somebody looking at me and I'm getting, it's making me upset. And I'm like, just leave it alone, leave it alone, it's okay. It's just, it was getting crowded and it was getting, it was getting tense inside the room and the bar. So I, I took a step outside. Something happened inside where people were just, it was kind of like chaotic for a second. It must've been, I think a, what had happened is a fight had happened inside. I was like, we better, we better get out of here. And it was kind of some commotion going on and some people running around and security guards screaming happening. And so we just literally walked across the street and I could see my truck. And I remember just, for some reason, I, I heard this bottles fly by and they hit the ground. And I was like, what the heck? And I turned around and there were these, there were people that were coming towards us. And I looked over and a, a guy that I grew up with, Chris, was like kind of like hiding behind my truck. And I, I went to tell Chris like, hey, don't run, you know. Do, we're going to be okay. We have so many friends inside. It's not going to matter what's going to happen. It's going to be whatever. And I turn around and he's running. So I just immediately catch up to him. And why I even ran is bizarre. After a few minutes, um, I heard, I heard, uh, he hit your brother. He's running away. I look, I look forward and I see my friends uh, chasing somebody. We run and we cut around the back of this building and I turn and take uh, to break off to the right. And there's a little patch of grass and I slip in that patch of grass. And I remember trying to gather, gather my balance and somebody tackled me. And I remember thinking, all right, just, just curl up tight into a ball and you're gonna be all right. Upon turning the corner, arriving there, there's uh, my brother with along with three, three or four other guys. They're, they had they the young man on the floor and they're, they're, bidding, they're hitting him. Uh, one guy had a pool stick, I can remember that vividly. Another my friend of mine was kicking him and I see my brother over him punching him. I remember somebody saying, back up, back up, back up never forget that. And I remember just like tightening up as tight as I could tighten. I'm thinking, I'm gonna just, they're gonna shoot me, I'm dead. And um, and somebody would come in and kick me in the, in the head. And then I remember it just being wet. Like I remember just being wet. And I remember it was just like as if rain was falling. And I remember thinking to myself, man, this is it. Like, I can't take much more of this. My, my, just shutting down and finally somebody kicked me and at that point um the last time my my eardrums popped and i remember it was just like a like a, like the sound you hear flatline it was like ee! 
from the from a distance, I could hear police, I could hear just just uh, loud noises happening. So I'm like, we gotta get going, we gotta get going. The police are coming, let's go. And once I see my brother there, I um, uh, he's he's like, Eddie, I hurt my hand, I hurt my hand, and, and we're like, what happened? And uh, I looked down at his hand, and he had cut it. I'm like, how'd you cut your hand? And he's like, I cut, I, I was I was um, I had broke a bottle, and I was hitting the guy with the bottle, with you know, cutting him. And so I'm like, holy smokes, we gotta get you to the hospital. Upon arriving to the hospital, we're in the waiting room and look over the corridor and uh, we see uh, friends of the subject that we hurt. And we see him, them talking to policemen and they're kind of pointing their finger and it's like, you know, I had to go to court. Um, I pled guilty. I pled uh, guilty to uh, some charges because if I didn't, if I went to jury, I was looking at 20 years in prison. And I'm like, I can't do 20 years in prison. So, you know, I took, I took a plea. But my brother, who did actually injure the gentleman, uh, Ben Reese is his name. Um, he did a five, five and a half years in, uh, in jail. And my brother lost a lot of his, you know, his younger years in life. And then I think a couple days later, I, I woke up. From that point, I remember, I think I stayed there for, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 days. And then they... They took me, they were like, hey, you're gonna be okay. So you should be able to go home and, and start, you know, it's gonna be a long process to be able to rehab, to be able to ever write again, to be able to ever use your hands again, to be able to do anything again for a long time. And you just build this this crazy feeling up of like, dude, I cannot wait to pay these guys back. I'm just thinking like, I'm gonna kill these guys. Like I'm fully going to pay these guys back. And I'm thinking every day is this thing. Like it was actually the crazy motivator for me to like, I'm getting my hands back. I'm getting my, I'm getting this back. Find out where these guys are and, and that's what's gonna happen. Fast forward, uh, my wife and I, um, we got into real estate. The early years of my marriage, or actually a lot of my marriage, you know, I wasn't a great husband at all. You know, I was a great provider, a great dad. Um, and I pretend to be a great husband but there was a lot of uh, things that I was doing on the side. Um, I found myself divorced. I was ashamed of what I had done and uh, too prideful and I couldn't humble myself to, to speak it, uh, speak of it to anybody, including my family. And I uh, found myself in a very dark spot. i never forget um, one morning, uh, I had a friend of mine named Jeff Kirby, uh, an acquaintance of mine at the time, he's, he's a good friend now. Um, he approached me at the gym and said, hey, Eddie, you still selling real estate? And uh, I said, yeah, yeah, of course. And I would probably, once again, put on his face like, yeah, I'm still selling real estate. Uh, he's like, well, I'm looking to sell my property. Uh, you think maybe you can sell my house? And I'm like, yeah, of course I can sell your house, Jeff. I said, well, Jeff, I'll pray for you. And uh, which cut up to that point, you know, I'm in my late thirties. I had not prayed for myself. And so I said that, you know, out of just saying that, but he turns around and looks at me. He's like, Eddie, are you a Christian? So he's like, oh, I'm so I'm so embarrassed that I haven't asked you to men's group. You know, we meet every Friday at 6 a.m. And internally, I'm thinking, oh, great. But out of obligation, out of like, well, he gave me his business. I better show up. You know, it's a Friday morning. I show up. There's a gentleman on stage that there, runs on stage. His name is Les Piercy. He runs on there. And I'm like, oh, that's the guy from the TV. I remember him on TV. I go from Lamont. He had a store down the street from me. And he asked, he's like, is anybody new here? Anybody new show up today? And I'm like, raise my hand. And uh, he's like, you come with me. So we come into a, go to, to a private setting. I'll never forget this because I remember I felt, I felt odd to begin with that I was there. And as soon as they, they finished uh, praying, this gentleman who's sitting across the, uh, the table at the, um, starts speaking of his divorce. And, um, and he gets, gets, gets emotional and he's, he's in his late fifties at this time. And uh, he starts talking about the hurts and, and what he's going through, what he's dealing with. And everything that he's talking about is stuff that I had been, that I had obviously felt, everything that I can relate, but I had never, spoke about it I never spoke of it and so I just started bawling and for the first time in years you know with that situation that I've been in my divorce you know I just I just felt oh my god it just felt good to cry and I'm just there soaking it all in and, and he's like well they wrapping it up I'm thinking let's continue I'm like it felt okay. I, was, I was actually excited to be there like this is pretty cool I couldn't wait I'm like well, when you guys meet again next Friday I couldn't wait for the next Friday I was like, super excited for next Friday my father and my uncle Paul always had told me that if you go to Montana, we love to hunt and fish. And that was the place they had never been there, but they had sold me that that was the place to ever go. The life of wanting to like kill Eddie and his brother and these things just like kind of, they didn't, they never went away. But my life I was like, man, I gotta get out of this. I gotta get out of Bakersfield, this is bad.
I go to Montana and start my life. I go to school there, and but my life is constantly in turmoil. It's constant, constant stuff. My cousin Collins um, was at uh, was starting to go to church and go to these Bible groups. I really didn't know much about it, but I was I had a pheasant hunting trip we were going on, and some people canceled. And I was t- talking to Collins one day in passing. And he lived here in Bakersfield, and I was still in Montana. And I said, "Hey," he said, "Hey, I think I got some guys that would want to go on that." And I was like, "Great, cool, cool," you know, and. I remember there was a, a person there and we're kind of getting everything set up for the day before. And I was like, Hey man, what's going on? And this guy says, man, do you know much about these guys that are coming? And I'm like, no, what are you, what are you talking about? Dude, these guys are crazy Christians, dude. Bible thumpers. They, they just, and I was like, what? Like, what are you talking about? You know? And he's like, Oh, dude, these guys, it's big time. You know? And I'm like, what, what I'm thinking to myself, what am I got myself into? This is, this is, this, this is so not me. And what is this? Sure enough, less and, his crew show up of uh, Bible thumpers, I would say. And uh, I go to this journey group and I remember I was listening, it was an overnight deal and, I, and I, we were at this ranch <laughs> and all these guys are telling their stories of, you know, their struggles, you know. Then that morning, Les is like, hey, it's your turn to go. And I'm like, like, okay, just give them a, give them a, you know, you, you know, give them some of their stuff. Cause even though you've never done some of that stuff, I uh, started to talk. And then I just remember saying everything I've ever done. And um, it wasn't what any of them did or said to me, but it was in that moment that I was like, dude, I'm free. There's no more darkness. I remember early, I would be like, God, why did you even let me get to this point? Like you could have taken me off this earth a long time ago for what I did to your people, like how I hurt. Like, I I don't even know why you would forgive me. They say you do, your word, I read it, but but why, like how, like who, what what is this? Hey man, I'm just so in love with God, so in love with like, like what he does. And uh, I remember uh, I'm still finishing stuff up in Montana because I've messed everything up there completely, just ruined everything I've ever touched. I'm actually going to move back to Bakersfield at the time. I'm actually transitioning already back to come back to Bakersfield. Les says to me, uh, you know, let's co- co-lead with me. And he sends a list to all of us of all these people. And I remember um, seeing uh, uh, a name on the list, a guy named Eddie. And I remember going, uh, calling Les and be like, hey, who's this guy, Eddie? I recognize the name. He's like, I don't know, man. He said, these people just sign up and we just, you know, we put them on a list. So we had taken a break, so we can, we, can, we can get this roster for the new season. And I'm looking at the roster, and there's a lot of names on there. And I see the name Ben Reese. And I'm like, Ben Reese? What could it be? And it said his name was, he's from Montana. I'm like, oh, it can't be him. He's from Montana. So I'm looking across. I'm like, could it be him? I can't remember, 18 years had passed. I'm like, it was night, whenever it was dark, whenever everything took place. And I'm like, I just couldn't, no, I'm like, no, it's not him. It's not him. And then I thought to myself, wow. I do know this guy. I recognize his name. There's no way. There's just no way. I was like so anxious. Like, I don't even know why I was anxious um, to like, to ask him. But I, the time couldn't go any slower during the journey group, so. So we went through, the, through our session, uh, wrapped it up, and I'm getting my Bible and get my stuff put together. And I, when I look up, I see him coming towards me. I say, hey, Eddie, can I talk to you? And he goes, you Eddie Resendez? And uh, it took a second for me to be like, yeah, I'm Eddie Resendez. And then um, he said, where are you from? He said, I grew up in Lamont. But it was just, he just wouldn't look at me. He just kept looking down. And as soon as he said, where are you from? You know, for some reason, when you, when, you, when, someone, when I'm asked that, I'm like, oh, this, this, there's meaning to that, where are you from? And I just kept, my heart kept wanting to just jump out of my skin, I felt like. And I was like, it's, this is it, this is, this is him. And I said, hey, you have a brother? And he's like, yeah, my brother Gabriel. Do you know him? I, and I said, yeah, I know your brother. And he looks up at me. He says, it's you, Ben. It's you. And inst- instantly, I'm like, I, I said, you're Ben Reese. He's like, I'm Ben Reese. And he's, I said, yeah, Eddie, it's me, man. And I wanted to say the first words to him. And he said, man, the last time I remember seeing you is we just left you in an alley in a, a pool of blood for dead, man. And the first, I mean, first thing he says to me is like, man, I'm looking forward to meeting you and, and hoping to meet your brother. I said, man, Eddie, it was a long time ago, dude, when you and your brother did that to me. But you're forgiven. And dude, life goes on from this point. 
and I'm just overwhelmed with like, I'm just thinking, what the heck? And I was just so like, I'm just getting this numbness over me or just lost of words. And I'm like looking at him like, what? The craziest part is I, I wanted to kill this guy and his brother, but to see those thoughts have never rained in my head ever, ever since the moment I met him, the moment I heard his, read his name on that list, all those years, that thought never came into my mind. All my thought was, was I just want to forgive this guy. I just want to, I want to, I want to like forgive this guy. And I was kind of like, I was just thinking, what the heck just took place right now? And uh, so I walked out and I called, I called my, my mom, I called my sister, and I called everybody. Like, you won't believe who I met right now. And you won't believe what he told me that he forgave me, he forgives me, and he loves me. Well, how can you take something? from one spot and 15 years later put two guys in one thing. There's no coincidence with the Lord. He's just that powerful. And then put you both in a group at a church. And um, never forget that opportunity that I had to bring my brother to meet him, and my dad to meet him at an M24. And I got a chance to, to introduce them and, and uh, you know, to see Ben and my brother, you know, shake hands and then hug. And so it's been really neat. It's been really, really neat to be able to share life uh, on a whole different level with, with Ben and his family. And, I think how big God is, and and, and, and he, he, his plan was so impactful with this thing that that one day that Eddie and I would do this and become friends, and our families would be be friends, and we would we would hang out, and they would watch our dog when we go out of town, and 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 love on us, and that God took such pain, such tragedy, such loss. I, I say this to people, I've never seen God's face and I've never heard his voice. But man, I have seen his power, like power beyond no avail. Wow. Eddie, Ben. Thanks for sharing your story with us. Um, I've heard that and seen that a number of times, and uh, it never loses its power. It never loses its power. Ben, you know, I, I, I see you talk about how you were feeling, you know, after that happened to you, you know, and talking about getting the use of your hands back so you could use them for vengeance. It's visceral, right? I, I could feel it. I could see it in you. Uh, we know the end of the story, which is amazing, but take, where do you think you'd be today, Ben, if, if you didn't forgive? Where, where would you be if you let that, that vengeance, that bitterness kind of fester in your soul? Where, where would you be? You know, John, I, <clears throat> I kind of thought about this question a lot, actually, and I, I for sure wouldn't be right here where we're at with, with, with the, the situation. I mean, it, I would be dead. I, I think I would be dead. I thought a lot of like, oh yeah, I'd probably be maybe in jail or, or prison or, or, you know, who knows, but I think I've come to the realization I'd be dead. I wouldn't, I, I really believe that in some of these moments that the further I've dug into God that I, I, I don't think I could have kept going the direction I was going. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I heard you say, you know, you, you moved from Bakersfield to Montana. It almost sounded to me like that was an attempt to escape. Like if I if I get away from this geographically, maybe this pit in my stomach will go away. It didn't work though, huh? No, you no. can never change. You can't change. You can only change with the Lord. My, my, I could have ran. I could have moved 20 different places. But until I ever, until God found me, however that took place, well, I, I want to talk to you a minute about that because that was that's my favorite part of the story is when you're you're sitting there around that table and you're thinking about, hey, I'm going to tell these guys what they want to hear so I can get out of here, right, and never come back again. And I, I use some words like, I opened my mouth and I said everything I ever did. Right. And then you said there was no more darkness. There was freedom. So how does that happen? Right? How does it go from I want to kill this guy to I forgive in my heart? How does that happen? Yeah, that, yeah that's interesting. When I listened to the, the video, uh, the, 
the part I think they they cut out little stuff, you know, and I remember seeing there telling the guy like I uh I remember listening to all the men. There must have been like 17 or 18 men at this thing and they were talking about their struggles, you know, pornography, infidelity, these things and I'm just staring at all these guys going dude, I'm not saying nothing. Like I've done way worse than these guys. Like, this is awesome. These guys are great guys. I mean, and mm-hmm. when I was saying that I'm, I'm just going to give them some of their stuff, I'm like, this stuff is good. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm so much worse than this. And if I tell these guys what I did, they're going to, because I've hurt people like physically hurt people in my life. And I kept thinking to myself, which was the enemy speaking in my, in my head, but what if it was one of their children? And then they're going to remember who you were. And so I just remember being like, all right, I'm going to sleep. And as soon as everybody goes to sleep, I'm going to fake a sleep that I'm out of here, man. I'm going to get out of here. And then that morning I woke up and, and, and that's what happened. I, I got up and, and last we were said, Hey, it's your turn. And I started to talk and it was a complete lie. Like my entire life to just like say something. Then it just all, hmm. it all came out. And then it was, that feeling where God's like, now, son, come on, you're free. Mm. So you experienced his forgiveness of you and you're then able to forgive yeah. a guy like Eddie and his brother, Gabriel. So Eddie, what, what did it feel like to, I, I remember this. I was there in this environment when this happened. I remember hearing the buzz of, Hey, what's going to go down? You know, that was, it was still like, what's going to happen. And uh, I, I remember that. So Eddie, what, what was it like? to hear those words from Ben, you know, you said it, you called people, you said, he forgives me. And he said, he loves me. What, what was that like? What has it done to you? Up to that point in my life, um, I had never had a man tell me he loves me. Uh, and it was rare. I hadn't even had my dad at that point tell me he loves me. And so um, this was all new to me. This, this, the influencers, the group was new to me. I was, it was in my first season. And so I was, I was in a very uh, emotional state at that time. I was, I was, I was an emotional wreck, to be honest with you. So to have, you know, have this interaction with Ben and, and you know, him standing in front of me and, uh, and I'm looking at the man who, you know, for 17 years of my life, I blame for a lot of situations that took place in my life. Hmm. You know, when something, there was a certain roadblock in a career path because of my record, I, I, I kid you not, I'd be like that freaking Ben, hmm. that freaking Ben Reese. And there was another job opportunity and, it wouldn't happen. Well, freaking Ben, you know, so I always had that, you know, a little, uh, that bitterness and anger towards him, you know, because in my mind, the way I had it played out was like, he had that coming to him. You know, that was, wow. that was what I, what I played back over and over. So I was um, new to my walk, you know, I was just, you know, I was hurt and emotionally hurt. And so I was, I already had a whole bunch on my, in my head and my heart. And then to have that interaction with him and then him standing in front of me and then him telling me he forgave me, and then that he loved me, I'm like, it was like overwhelming. <laughs> it was overwhelming. Like, what is happening in my life right now? Crazy. You know, and just, um, you know, I didn't even know what to say. I'm just looking at him. I just like, I just couldn't believe that, you know, that he was physically standing in front of me, telling me he loves me mm-hmm. and forgave and, for, and has forgiven me. And so I remember taking his hands. I remember taking his hands and looking at his hands because were the wounds that he had. And I'm like, I just felt so much guilt. And there was so much like just emotion that went through me. And, uh, but there was no words. I can really speak no words. I'm like, can we talk about this later? I just wanted to actually like, I wanted to run. Like, I just, it's not real. Surreal. Right? Surreal. 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 You know, guys, I, I, uh, hear this story, see this story. And as I was listening to it again, between you guys, I, I thought about a fork in the road, you know, and how that event that night in front of that bar was, a, it was a fork, It was. but really the fork the, the true fork that made the eternal difference is what you did with it 18 years later, right? If you had chosen not to forgive each other, you already said where you would have been and you probably feel the same way. But right. so that, that fork in the road of forgive or not forgive is so critical. Um, I, I just see that in you guys and forgiveness isn't a one and done thing, right? It, it plays out in our life since then right? In our marriages, in our home, in our workplaces, whatever. So I just want to give each of you an opportunity to just share quickly, how has that theme of forgiveness changed your life since then in other relationships? I'll let you go first. No, I I did think about this because I was actually going through a study of the book of Nehemiah and and the question was asked, um, who have you not forgiven? And so going through my memory bank, 
all that came to my mind was how I have been forgiven many times over mm. my, my offenses. I mean, people who offended me were very minor and I never have had that, that, that need to actually feel like, uh, you know, to forgive because it was like, nobody really hurt me. You know, I've always been the bad person in the story. And I was thinking of like, Well, fellas, clearly uh, the main location and speakers have uh, gone dark on us. Um, because we have several resources there, and uh, from Oscar sends me a note, we had a power outage at Steve Webb. Hold on a second, guys. We just had a breaker trip. There so give us, give us a couple minutes. The power just completely went out here at the main site. All right, Gary, Here's we got you covered. Here. Very good. We can see you now on one of the main locations. As I was saying, um, I was thinking back of my life and how I had been the, the one that's always offended people. And, uh, and so in that thinking that I'm like, God, you're such an amazing God, you know, such a forgiving God. And, uh, and there was a point in my life where I'm like, man, I just, I felt like I wasn't punished enough. Hmm. Like I'm thinking I've done all this bad, but my, 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 my punishment hasn't been enough. I'm like, this is too good. I'm in a, an amazing group of men who are loving me, who are, who are just, you know, pouring their, their hands on me and getting me closer to you and teaching me how to walk as a real man. And I had Ben, you know, telling me he forgave me. So I was just thinking, how, I just think thought of God's love, you know, God's love and, and that ultimate sacrifice of his son to bear my, a lot of Eddie's sins, Come you know, on, a lot of Eddie's sins, all of them. <laughs> You know, and so I just, you know, I, it just amazes me. And I'm so, just so thankful. I'm just so thankful where I'm at right now. And it's been, you know, it's all God's hand. And now looking back at it, uh, Tyler mentioned earlier, he's like, he can see around the corner, Eddie. You know, mm. at that moment in time, I, I, you feel like it's the worst thing ever. But he knew what was around the corner awaiting me. And, uh, and, and he, that's, how, that's, how, that's, that's what God does. That's what a father does. That's what he does. That's what a father does. He just He's protects. So good. He protects and loves. And he, but he, you know, he, mm. he, he put right into the, through the mud for a little bit, but. Uh, yeah, where I'm at right now, you know, I, I, I'm truly thankful. I know uh, you said in early in your story, uh, you got divorced. What happened then? So I got divorced. <laughs> who, who are you married to now? So I married my high school sweetheart. And uh, so, uh, you know, we got divorced for four years. She divorced me, rightfully so. She divorced me for, for you know, for not being the husband I should be and who I was called to be. And so um, through the journey and through the process of my, you know, you know, my walk and, and understanding what I was to be called as a man and a, and a leader of the household, um, we got remarried. Come uh, on. Three and a half years ago, we got remarried. <laughs> it has not been easy. It has not, it has not been an yeah. easy process, but I'm, I'm willing to, you know, I mean, just the simple fact that we get, a, we get that opportunity, you know, to, to make things right and to honor God through the process, you know, it's, it's worth the fight. Come on. It's worth the fight. Love so, you, brother. Yeah, thank you. Ben, how about you? How has forgiveness continued to play out um, in your life since then? Man, I, that's a very challenging <laughs> question. I, I actually don't even really want to answer that question because... Sorry. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I get, it seems like I get a really hard question and Eddie gets really easy ones. So, this I is asked just him not, the same thing. Yeah, then. I know, but it's just, he's got a better answer than me, so... <laughs> No, you guys, I, I can only say that this forgiveness thing is, it's crazy and it's tough. I mean, I truly like, I mean, I'm exhausted. Um, I can tell you that, uh, that we relived that video and walked down there and, uh, and I remember standing where his brother said, I remember where it all happened and we're standing in this spot where, you know, I was left. And I just thought of, uh, what came into my mind at that point was, um, my, I mean, my heart, God said, Ben, do you see, can you hear me? My word is alive. Hmm. And he said, I make all things good. Whoa. All things good. And I, Though you, you know the verse better than I do, but I, I, I hit it on my phone because I thought of it this morning when I and it says, uh, and when you know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his word. And that night that was pure evil, but I was evil too. But God turned everything and made it for his good. And he said, Ben, 
my word is alive and you've just saw it with your own eyes. Come on. And you guys, I can tell you, even in this moment, it's the hardest times of my life. And I love the Lord with all my heart. I serve the Lord with all my heart. And, uh, you know, I've had to have some big forgiveness in the last little bit um, for forgiving my wife for things that have happened. But even more recently, in these moments that I'm here today, you know, uh, I have a, I own a company and a, a man that I love with all my heart, um, who's like my, he's my general manager of my company, um, fell off and, and got sideways with drugs while he's running my company. Hmm. And I look and I'm like, God, what do I do? And he's like, Ben, you forgive him and you keep moving. <laughs> and he's here today, mm. still working for me. <laughs> and God is like, and I'm a table servant that serves people today. And I have to serve this man. And I said, God, mm. am I not humble enough? But now you make me serve this man. And he says, my heart is, no, Ben, you're not humble enough that you even have to ask me for that. Sometimes, you guys, we have to forgive. We're the most merciless people. But God wants us to have mercy on everyone. And so mm. it never stops. But <laughs> I'll never stop. Uh, I'll never stop serving the king. Just in the way. Forgiveness is messy, right? And it's hard. It's tough. But boy, there's freedom in it, right? There's power in it. And guys, thank you for sharing God's story of forgiveness in your lives. That's what it is. It's his story. It's really not yours. It's his story of grace and forgiveness through your lives. So thank you for sharing. And, and men, what we want to do now, as I mentioned earlier, is we want to pause for just a minute, and we're just going to take a moment of silence in our own minds and, and think about this theme of forgiveness. Maybe ask the Holy Spirit, wh where is this theme relevant right now in my heart, in my mind? So we're going to pray individually, uh, I think, and, uh, and then I'll pray us out of that time. Father, we, we love because you loved us first. We're, we're only able to forgive because you've forgiven me. As Eddie said, offenses against me are so small when they compare them against my sins against you. So Father, thank you for your forgiveness, for your grace, for your mercy, for your kindness that you showed in Jesus on the cross. Lord, would you stir up our hearts and our minds to know where we need to live this out? Maybe it's we need to accept your forgiveness for ourselves. Maybe it's we need to allow that forgiveness to flow through us to others. So would you do a work in our hearts today? In Jesus' name, amen. So guys, would you take your journals right now and, and write down some thoughts about what, what was going through your mind there in that moments of silence as you asked the Lord, what do you want me to know about this topic of, of forgiveness and grace? What do you want me to know? Make it personal. How does this apply to me? 
So just journal for a minute and then I'll lead us into what we're gonna do next. All right, man, I see, I see pens still moving. Just keep, keep journaling as I talk. What we wanna do next is move into a, a little time of, uh, of sharing at your tables. You know, you've been placed at these tables um, with guys that we'll be with for the morning. And we wanna give an opportunity to share with each other uh, what, what we've been hearing, what the Holy Spirit's been speaking to us about, to me about. Let's make this personal about forgiveness. And we're going to have a little opportunity later to tell our stories. So right now, let's just really focus on this topic of forgiveness. Do I feel that grace and that forgiveness that the Father offers me? And am I offering it to, some, to, to others? Are there places in my heart where bitterness and resentment are hanging out? And... Uh, who knows what he'll do? Uh, it's pretty cool. So as you finish your journaling, just start at your tables and, uh, and be bold. I'd encourage us guys, let's, let's share from our hearts on this topic of forgiveness. So go ahead and uh, have some discussions at our tables.
great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke him Thank you.
God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. Okay, guys, can you, uh, if you can hear me, give me a wave. All right, cool. Um, I hope your discussions are good and you can, you can keep going. Um, we're going to take a, a quick break if you need to get rid of some coffee or something like that. And um, then we're going to come back in about 10 minutes and we're going to move into our next thing. So if you want to keep talking, you can, but we are going to have an opportunity to share some more in about 10 minutes. So if you need to take a break and then I'll, I'll be back in 10. Thanks, Paul. Oh, that breaks me down. Fellows, we welcome you back into the main room from your breakout session. And we thank our table listeners for leading that time. Thanks, men. Field insignia thing. Okay, guys, some of you that were in your breakout rooms virtually, you can hear me now. Uh, those of you who are listening, you can ignore me because I'm going to say the same thing. We're going to take a 10-minute break if you need to get rid of some coffee or something like that, and then we'll get back on at 9.15 and uh, move into our next thing, which you will not want to miss. So uh, we'll see you in a few minutes. Cool.
Are we back? Fellas, it's about time to start uh, returning to your chair or to the couch, to the table. We will resume in just a few minutes. Hi, Daryl, welcome back. As I said, my computer has just about had it. I apologize. No need to apologize. All good, brother. All good. Just tell David I, I'm, I'll be praying for him. And he can hear you uh, as we say that. So thank you. Thank you, Daryl, and, and all goodness. Oh, good. Uh, all, all goodness back at you. All righty. Well, fellows, we trust that your breakout session was fruitful. Uh, the time, though brief, was shared and that there was prayer in the breakout session. Good morning, Donnie. And fellows, uh, to reiterate, if you need to reach or you have questions, go ahead in the chat bar and share your question. We'll try to address that as we walk through the morning together. We want to thank uh, our brothers, uh, Eddie and Ben, for a powerful start to the morning. More than powerful, very meaningful. We thank our brothers, uh, John and Dan, for getting us organized and getting us started. And uh, fellows, I hope each of the breakout groups either began or ended with prayer or had prayer over the brother that seemed to need it most. Test check one, two, three, test one, two, three. Check John, we one. hear you very well. Huh? We hear you very well. Okay. All right, guys. I, uh, I trust that time was pretty powerful for some. Some of you may have unloaded some rocks out of your backpack. There's different ways to say it, but uh, you know, I just I love to think about Ben and Eddie's story and how they express the relief that came um, from sharing. So uh, we're going to do some more of that, guys. We're going to actually take an opportunity now to tell our stories uh, to the guys at your table. And uh, some of you may have never done this before, and many of you have. Uh, but this is another opportunity to actually uh, to open up and to share some important things in our lives. Um, ben and Eddie led the way for us, and uh, we're going we're gonna to kind of follow in those footsteps. So what is it going to look like? Each man is going to have about 20 minutes to tell their story. Now, some of us are uh, you know, on the other side of 50 or whatever. So we have a lot of, right, we could talk for days about our lives. So there's obviously not time to do that. But what we want to do is take a minute or two and share just some things about your life, um, you know, where you grew up, siblings, stuff like that. But pretty quickly transition in to the important stuff. I mean, that, that's really why we're here. We're here to talk about the things that have shaped us, the things that really have affected maybe our faith journey. Maybe some of the things that we've done, maybe some things that have been done to us that have profoundly affected our faith journey, maybe the way we view God, maybe the way we receive forgiveness or, or are able to give it to others. And guys, we just want to share that with each other. Like, this is my story. There is no right or wrong story. Um, some people's stories uh, haven't had huge ups and downs. Others have. There is no right or wrong story. There's just my story and your story and your story. And that's the story that God honors. And he wants to tell those. He wants us to tell those stories. He wants, uh, he wants those to be heard. Um, so do that at your tables. Your table listener will keep a, a timer and give a five-minute and two-minute warning. Because we do want to respect time. We want every man. Every man here is important. And we want every man's story to be heard. So at about 15 minutes and then 17 minutes or so, uh, we want to be done with the story. And then what we're going to do is pray over that guy. So at the end of your story, if you could share something like, this is what I'm really wrestling with right now. This is what I could use prayer for. Um, you can share that. And, and one of the men at your table will pray for you. And then we'll move on to the next story. 
So guys, this is, this is an opportunity to answer the invitation to refresh. We can go through the motions. We could stay at a surface level and we can leave from here and say that was a nice time. Or we have the opportunity here to answer the invitation and go a little bit deeper or maybe a lot a bit deeper and get some stuff out there in the open. And uh, man, it's a life changer. Guys, I can only say, I have never heard a man say, man, I regret doing that. I've just never heard it. <laughs> and I have heard tons of stories of men who have said, that's the best thing I ever did. It's the most freeing thing I've ever done. I see head shaking because I know that I've, I see some of you that I've been in the room with you when it happened. So men, let's do that. Let's accept his invitation. Uh, let's, let's take that time to, to, to uh, get together. So we're going to do this until 1040. So that's about an hour and 20 minutes that we have. So if there are four of you, we should be in groups of four. If you're in groups of like six or seven or eight, you need to break down in halves because there will not be enough time. So groups of four, about 20 minutes per person, including a prayer. Uh, and then we'll get back together at 1040. I'm going to pray us out and uh, let's do it. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your story uh, of redemption in our lives. There may be some here today that that story has not yet been written. And, and, and today might be the day. Uh, but we thank you for the stories that you are writing, Portraits of Grace. Father, you love us. You've brought us through many things. We've all made many mistakes. We've done stupid things. But you are kind and gracious to redeem those. So would you open our hearts? Would you give us boldness and courage to share things? Would you make the ears at the table receptive and attentive? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jesus, I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit truly know that thou art mine. I surrender. Oh, to the mm. 
my life worthy of every song could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever bring we live for you we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. You're worthy of all the breath we should ever sing. You're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. You're Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those. 
course with me. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. Oh, we'll sing how great, how great is our God. How great Welcome back, man. Wasn't that worship awesome? Thank you, Brenton. That was great. Wow. Man, I don't know about you guys. We had some awesome stories in my group before. Unbelievable. Just to hear God is doing and refreshing all over the place. But I'm not going to lie. Here in Bakersfield, we've switched over from solely refresh to solely refrigerate. It is cold. And I'm looking down on the screen. I see Ron Froelich. There's a ceiling fan going above his head in Costa Rica like it's hot down there. I'm coveting Costa Rica right now. Isn't that how we are, right? Aren't we like sheep? We're in a pasture that God provides. And it's awesome, but yet we find the fence and we try to stick our head through the fence and eat the grass on the other side. Somebody's showing us a picture of snow outside. That's what it feels like in Bakersfield right now. But we're always, right? We're sheep that go astray. We're never content with what God gives. And um, that's just how we are. We go through the wilderness. God provides manna. And we, we feed on manna, and it's not good enough. What, what do we want then? Quail. quail, right? And then he dumps quail on us, and we're just never thankful for what God provides. If we, 
if we really want to dry ourselves out as we walk through this wilderness, we can, we can say this sentence right here. I deserve, and then fill in the blank, dot, dot, dot. I deserve, dot, dot, dot. When my wife and I, Amanda, got married, I'd just gotten out of college. She was a substitute school teacher, and we didn't have two nickels to rub together, so it was easy for us to be thankful for whatever God brought because we just didn't have much. And so we go through life. I'm working hard, doing my thing. She becomes a school teacher, and, and we start making a little bit more money, and I get this big job promotion. And all along through my whole career, I had never, ever asked for a raise. I just let God provide what He was going to provide. But I get this big promotion, and all of a sudden, I deserve dot, dot, dot. I deserve dot, dot, dot. So I made a plan. I was going to go into uh, my, perform my annual performance review, and I made a plan. I was like, you know what? I deserve 5% this year, 5% next year, and a 5% raise the year after. I had figured this out. I had made spreadsheets. I had made graphs. How I deserved a 5% raise, another 5% raise, and another 5% raise. My whole life, I had never done that. But it's for some reason at this point in my life, I thought I deserved this raise. For two weeks, I agonized about this, wrestled with God over this. I even talked to a buddy, not the same buddy on the last story. I'm like, what do you think? He's like, oh, you totally deserve that. You deserve it more than that. So agonized for weeks about this decision, whether to go to my board for the first time and ask for a raise because I deserved it. That night, guess what God did? He provided me with no sleep whatsoever. Not a wink of sleep. I wake up in the morning and I'm like, I knew God didn't want me to say a word about this. And so I go into that board meeting, I sit and I keep my mouth closed. And they revealed to me what my raise was going to be. They said, Dan, we want to give you an 8% raise. I was going to ask for 5 If I asked for 5 how much would they have given me? 5%, exactly. And just to put kind of a little uh, padding on, on what God was trying to show me, the next year, guess how much they wanted to give me? Another 8%. I was going to ask for 5 The third year I go in, they're like, hey, we want to give you 10%. I thought I deserved five. I was going to go in and ask for five. I thought I deserved five. And God each year gave me more than I could imagine. But to get that, I had to keep my mouth shut. And I had to just be thankful for what God has provided and trust Him to provide for what was right. I learned a valuable lesson. I never, ever to this day asked for a raise. God taught me a valuable lesson to be thankful for what He provides and to shut my mouth. Our speaker coming up next is going to speak on thankfulness. I love this guy. Jim Pennington is a third generation professional auctioneer. His auction marketing career has spanned 35 years and he has sold billions of dollars of livestock, real estate, and automobiles. Mr. Pennington was awarded the title of International Livestock Auctioneer Champion in 2000 at an annual competition in Calgary, Canada. He also has served as a president of California State Auctioneers Association. Jim and his wife, Amy, of 35 years, currently reside in Pismo Beach, California, enjoying semi-retirement from his auction, auction business. They enjoy spending time with their three children and four grandchildren. Currently, Jim is the Regional Director of Influencers Ministry at the Central Coast. As Director, Jim is influencing men to a close, personal, abiding relationship with Christ. Influencers is a men's discipleship ministry showing that faith and career can be lived out boldly together, not separately. Jim believes that God has given us not a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and discipline. Please help me welcome Jim Pennington. Thank you. Well, hello. It's good to be here. And like uh, Dan said, it is cold. Uh, Special shout out to all you guys, no matter where you are, across the country, uh, or even the world, I don't know. Uh, special shout out to you guys on the Central Coast uh, over there. Uh, it's probably warmer there. Usually it's warmer here. 
You know, thankfulness, that's a, uh, that's a big word. Um, and I, I'm going to try to, I'm going to share God's story in my life. Um, and uh, I'm going to start at the back end of it to do with thankfulness. And then I'll fill in the blanks. I'm thankful this Thanksgiving that's coming up that uh, my whole family, my wife, my two kids, they're, they're, my three kids, their three spouses, I'm trying to keep track of the numbers here, and four grandchildren, the fifth one on the way, um, are going to be at our house for Thanksgiving to celebrate Thanksgiving. So you might think, well, that's no big deal. Everybody does that. We all go to grandma's house for Thanksgiving. And yeah, it's probably, you know, that's right. Um, but uh, I want to share with you a story of a miracle, a supernatural miracle in my family and in my life to do with my relationship with Jesus Christ. Because, see, if this hadn't happened, the story I'm about to share with you, more than likely wouldn't be meeting this Thanksgiving in a few weeks with all my family. It would have been impossible. It wouldn't have worked. So, yes, I'm thankful for Thanksgiving here in a few weeks. So let me start, uh, you know, I'm kind of your typical Christian. I was. I accepted Christ when I was eight years, ten years old at a church camp. And I truly believe that I, I did accept Christ. I did, I did invite him into my heart, and I, I, I do feel he came, and uh, I believe that. But uh, as time went on, you know, I grew up in a pretty legalistic church. Uh, they, they really, really uh, discouraged premarital sex. Uh, they, they thought it could lead to dancing. Uh, no, really. I mean, the more they talked about dancing, and I don't know, maybe it's a bad thing to dance. I don't, I don't know. But really? You can't go to a dance. Well, we couldn't do a lot of things. And for those of you that know me, um, probably the best way to get me to do something, I'm working on this, but the best way to get me to do something is tell me I can't. Um, and the best way to get me to do something I really don't want to do is, is tell me I can't. Uh, it used to be way bad. <laughs> But, you know, God made me a certain way, and sometimes we are who we are. Well, I was who I was throughout my teenage years, as I'm going to get into here, my, my, my 20s. But, you know, first, just let me say, as I, as I went through, I became a rebellious teenager. Um, I couldn't follow the rules. I wasn't good enough. I, I, I hated the guilt. Um. I wasn't a, a rule follower. I'm still not. Uh, I get married when I'm 19 uh, because that way I wouldn't be guilty anymore about having sex before marriage. I mean, that was at least one reason I got married so early. Well, it didn't last. It lasted a year, got a divorce. We did have a beautiful daughter. Um, my my oldest daughter, my only daughter. Um, so that was a great blessing and still is. Um, but when I got the knock on my door from that church, the legalistic church um, that I had attended all, all my life, and the deacons were there to, to be, you know, kick me out of church, said I couldn't come no more because I was, you know, I was getting a divorce and he you can't get a divorce, not in this church. 
All right. Well, it was really kind of a relief because I really just went off. Um, I, I went to what, I didn't have to worry anymore about the guilt and about the law and everything. I didn't think I did anyway. Um, and so I just, I just kind of took off in my early 20s. I, I did the proverbial uh, sow your oats, your wild oats, and all that kind of stuff. Um, chased a career. And uh, then I met my wife, my current wife, some five, six years after that. And got married and I had two more kids, two more boys. <laughs> and uh, by now, I, you know, I, I, I'll just kind of fast forward. I mean, I, I'm just, for lack of better, you know, I, I don't want to tell you all the details uh, to glorify anything, you know, but, but I, I chased the world, man, and I chased it, and I chased it hard. And I was kind of proud that I chased it harder than most people I knew, because I was pretty prideful. And so I chased and chased and chased, you know, the, the, what the world has the offer, you know, all the success that the world claims is success. And um, I traveled a lot, ended up with my own private jet. And um, I went where I want, did where I want, when I wanted, and whenever I wanted to. And tried to make money along the way and party along the way. And uh, that was till I was about 50. Right up against it anyway. And uh, by now, you know, of me after after this this time of living, basically living two lives. I really that's what I did. You know, I lived a life here in Bakersfield, where I li lived here in Bakersfield with the family and the business, and and then I had another life when I left town. And uh, I thought that was real honorable at the time. I wasn't mixing the two. Really thought that. I thought I was, I guess I thought I was fooling, fooling everybody. The only person I was fooling was myself. So it all blows up. Uh, a little about, about the way that it, blew, I mean, I, 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 had, I had retired when I was 40. I'd sold two businesses. I had plenty, I thought. But then I really partied hard. I was bored. And I'm not good when I'm bored. I'm better now. But uh, that just led to, uh, it just got worse. The kids grew up, left, left, uh, left home, went to college. So, you know, it's, it's the typical, just me and my wife, she, she was done. Uh, she'd wore out her knees praying for me, and um, a godly woman. But 28 years, she was done. And when she told me she was, I believed her. She told me this for 25, six years, every six months that she was done. I didn't believe her, and I was right. She was bluffing, and I knew it. So I let off the gas and then I'd put it back on. This time she told me, don't ask me how, but I believed it. I guess because she meant it. How did I know? I don't know. So I left. Uh, we, we split up. And uh, one of my big issues that she really always hated was my drinking. I, I, I drank a lot. Um, and so I thought, well, I'll, I'll go get help for that. She'll, she'll like that. So I was doing it for her, you know? So I go and I go to a, I go to a church ministry thing, church truth ministries, they call it kind of like a, a, uh, AA in a church. So there's this guy, I show up there, there's this guy there comes up to me, says, hey, you know, I don't know if this is really for you. And of course, I'd, I'd kind of shown him that. 
when I got there. I, I just basically told them I'm not here because I have a drinking problem. I'm here to get my wife back. Sorry, dude. I'm just not going to lie to you like some of you guys are doing. Uh, I might have a drinking problem. I might not. I don't know. Don't, don't really care. This guy pulls me aside. He says, uh, he was from here in Bakers. He was a fireman, he told me. He says, you ever heard of influencers? I said, nope. Well, they meet on Friday mornings over at the Bridge Bible Church. I said, where's that? I said, well, it's, you know, it's on the west side of town. Uh, meets at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. I, th I think you ought to check that out. Well, I'm in the mode of fixing things, <laughs> fix this broken situation. So I go the next morning and I pull in. I go, wow, this, this is kind of cool. A couple hundred uh, pickups sitting outside. And I'm thinking, you know, because I didn't know what to expect. This is the first time I've been back to church since, you know, I was kicked out of that one some 30 plus years ago. So I figure I'm going back to the same spot, right? I, you know, so but it wasn't. I walked in. It was like, you know, a bunch of regular dudes. You know, they, they didn't, sure didn't look like church guys, whatever that is. You know, in my mind, what a church guy was. Still don't know what a church guy is, but say it anyway. Uh, and, you know, the first, I run into two guys, uh, Cap and Collins. Collins Reimer and Cap Sprillip. I knew those two guys. Like, hey, well, you know, they looked at me like, oh, what, what's he doing here? <laughs> so they invite me in their group. And this is toward the end of the journey. If you haven't been in the journey, it's nine months. And this was like the eighth month, roughly. And so I completed the last month with them. And, and basically, they just let me explain what was going on in my life. And I hadn't really ever done that before, told another man about my, my problems or my issues. It, uh, if I'm talking to another man, I'm telling you how about my successes, not not my failures. It's just the way I was. I, I believe a lot of men are that way. I, you know, it's the way we're built. Sorry, but you know, after that, what happened was uh, we have, you know, in Bakersfield we have M24. You guys across the country may, may or may not know what that is, but it's 24 hours with God. And it's, it's all men. And we go to a location. And uh, a lot of praise and worship. A lot of stories. Hear, hearing men's stories. A lot of food. Um, I went very first year. Never been before. I get there. I come down. There's a thousand men out there. Pretty powerful. And I come down the hill. And I run into a man that I knew. Not really that well. Just our boys had played baseball together. His name is Mike Letourneau. And uh, he starts telling me a story out of the blue. I'm like, dude, what are you telling me this story for? And it is a story similar to mine. And he'd been unfaithful to his wife and uh, gotten caught in an affair. And he was telling me all about it and where he was at. And maybe she was going to forgive him, maybe not. And it was looking better. And he was telling me all this. And I'm like, whoa. I leave that night. I, I didn't spend the night. I had to be somewhere the next day. I leave, and God speaks to me that night on my way home. And he says, you must tell your wife. You must come clean. I'm like, nah, not doing that. And he worked on me all night, never slept all night. And um, so I, I uh, got up the next morning and thought, wow, this is, this is never experienced this before. So I called my oldest son, I called my daughter, and I confessed this to them that I hadn't been faithful to their mother, and I asked her forgiveness. I apologized. And they, it was, it was pretty instantaneous from those two. I called my youngest son, and he wasn't having nothing to do with it. And I understood, but I, I still asked. And uh, so then I knew, well, I've, now I've got, to, I've got to tell my wife. And uh, so I called her. And I haven't seen her in a month, maybe more. 
and I called to see if we could meet. So we met, and uh, we sat down at a picnic table at a park across from each other. I, I let it all out. And it was so uncanny that I felt this cloud, this black, smudgy cloud lift off of me when I did that. I just come and clean with everything. Because see, God had told me, if I put this back together and you have this secret, it won't work. And that's why I did it. Well, that cloud that went off for me, I saw it go across the table and rest on her shoulders. It wasn't very fun. And if she wasn't done already, she was really done now. So she left. And I said, wow, God, that, was, that really worked out well. I thought, you know, I mean, who knows? God's, his timing is it's perfect. <laughs> we usually don't know till later. Uh, so I don't see her until like another month or two and really to inform me she wants a divorce. And we're about six months into this thing now. And uh, so, so, okay, you know, uh, I didn't want one, but, you know, what are you going to do? And I prayed and prayed, and my brothers were praying, and, and uh, that night, I learned, I learned what uh, crying out to God meant. I learned what real prayer is. Not the prayers you hear in church, the same old phrases over and over, and from the head, not the heart. You've all heard them. I laid on my bed that night on my back and I cried like a baby. And I literally gave my wife, his daughter, back to him. I released her. I'd come to the end of my own self-sufficiency. I surrendered. I surrendered her and I said, Lord, protect her. I can't right now. And if you see fit to give her back to me someday, I will do my best to love her like you love the church. And I meant it. I wasn't making a deal. I wasn't, I meant it. And I also meant if he didn't do it, okay, I'm still going to follow you. And so I continued. We, we, the journey's about ready to start up again. This, this is now fall and uh, it's a school session kind of thing. And so uh, this year, uh, th this particular year, there was a September, and I go through the journey. <clears throat> and um, I learned what a close abiding relationship was with my father. Not, not what I thought I knew when I grew up in that legalistic church. I learned about grace. Um, I learned a lot. And God's still showing me a lot about grace. Well, what I, what I needed, I thought, you know, but it was out of my control was, I, I, I guess I, I needed my wife to forgive me and I needed my son to forgive me, my, other, my youngest son. And I knew she wasn't going to unless he did. I knew that. So lo and behold, we're into the next spring. So we're... we're we're a year, we're probably a good, well, yeah, we're over a year into this separation. And um, we started kind of seeing one, each other. We, we weren't dating, but we'd run into each other. We'd, we'd call her. So, so things were happening. I could, I, could, I could see God would just show me light. When I was, got really dark, he would show me some hope. God's good at that. And so my son, the one that hadn't forgiven me yet, went on a missions trip. He's a pastor. Well, he wasn't then. He was in college then, but he is, he is now. And he went on a missions trip to Indonesia for 30 days. And 
long story short, I mean, he tells this so much, and he's told this. Some of you over on the coast have heard his story at M6. But he had some supernatural things happen while he was over there, and he's, he's, he's trying to save Indonesia for the Lord, you know, uh, and, and share Christ when it's against the law. But he said all, all, all that came up was all these, these, these families in these villages that they would go to, they want to know about Americans' life. What's your family like? You know, and they all they know is Hollywood movies, I guess. And they but they want to know about the American family. And so all he, all, he here he goes all over the country saying, "Well, I got a dad that's a that's a a, a cheater. Uh, my mom and dad are probably getting divorced. So that's my family." Well, he, he didn't want he didn't, really didn't want to talk about it, but that's what he's being asked. Um. A Muslim man that had been converted to Christian, he's a leader of one of the villages, came up to my son out of the blue, put his arm around him, looked him in the eye and said, son, you need to go home and forgive your father. Well, that was like my son, David. So, oh, wow. That... And then he had a, a gal that was with him from the college that, that you know, had dreams. Like my son said, I, I know if I ever believed in dreams, but I guess... I guess so, but I've never had them, so I, I don't know. It's kind of weird to tell the story because some people don't believe this stuff, and I'm not trying to make them believe it, but I'm just telling you this is what happened. So if you don't believe it, deal with it. Well, this gal give this picture of this dream of, he said, she says, you know, when you get home, your family's going to be fine. I, I saw them on the beach. I saw you guys singing. David, you were playing your guitar. Your mother was there, and she had a smile on her face, and she, 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 her, she let her hands down. And she, I saw a 50-pound burden lift off her back, and she was happy and smiling. When you get home, things are going to be, be good. And there's more to that story, but save it for later. Fast forward. Um, Gets home to LAX. Uh, we drive down to pick him up, and uh, with his girlfriend, and he's sitting in the back seat with his girlfriend, and he's telling, he's bawling like a baby, asking me, me, if I would forgive him for holding again, uh, holding the feelings he had against me. I was asking his forgiveness. I'd been waiting a year, didn't know if I'd ever get it, and he's asking for mine. And it was something. <laughs> That's what I knew he was going to marry his girlfriend because he let it all out. You wouldn't do this in front of some girl you were dating. I don't think. So there it was. That was the miracle. Um, that was <laughs> that was I mean, <laughs> my wife will we've told this story together to couples and things and <laughs> She has said, you know, when she was sitting in the seat, when he was in the back telling this and asking me, of course, so she had been waiting for his approval all along. And I, I kind of knew that. I know, you know, I, I wasn't really no dummy. But, you know, I, I, I just had, I just knew. And so, so when she did, she says, I felt at that moment like a 50-pound weight come off of my back. Kind of like a prophecy from that. It wasn't in that particular order. Someday maybe you can hear my son's. It, it, it's even more radical than than I told it. It's 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 it makes you start believing in dreams. Uh, so so there's the miracle. There's the, there's the thankfulness um, that I have. See, I have a thankfulness now. My obedience, and I'm not obedient every day. I, I okay, but I try. 
and I spend time with the Lord every day, I'll miss. But my, my, my obedience comes from my thankfulness. Not, not from legalistic guilt or rules or trying to you know, impress other men with my behavior. I got a lot of work to do on, it's really easy to act like a Christian, but it's pretty tough to react like one. And I, I still got a lot of work to do there. I promise you that. Always will. But I'm okay with that because God, dude, I'm not saying God doesn't care. But you know, if he can put my marriage back together that was apart for a year and a half and she wanted a divorce and everything I did, did and everything I'd ask forgiveness for, and that miracle, I they're really I don't I'm kind of okay now. Have been for that was seven years ago, I think. And uh, I am all I have to do is think back to that when I look ahead, is just peek back. And uh, so, yeah, Thanksgiving's coming up. A few weeks. I'm really thankful that we're all going to be together because we almost weren't. That's all I got, guys. Thank you. Phenomenal. Beautiful. Beautiful. <clears throat> Jim, thank you. Thank you for being willing to tell his story in your and Amy's life. Um, it's amazing. You see, God is, that's how, that's how he rolls. You know, he, he takes a disaster, you know, a mess, you know, that Jim made of his life. He turns it right side up. And then he uses a guy like that to impact um, so many. Um, so thank you, Jim, for, for being faithful and for being willing to share your story. So guys, we want to we wanna do uh, what we did after our last talk is take a minute of reflection right now. I suspect there's a lot of different applications that the Holy Spirit might have for different men who are listening right now um, about what they just heard. So let's, let's just in silence ask the Spirit, what do you want me to know about what I just heard? How does what I just heard apply to me? Let's ask him and listen. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are the God that gives life to dead things, that calls things that are not as though they were. Lord, you've breathed new life into marriages. You've taken broken things and put them back together. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, just take a minute now and write in your journal uh, what it is that's uh, stirring in your heart right now.
It's great to see see guys with their heads down writing. So guys, as you finish uh, writing in your journal, then circle up at your tables and this will be our last table share and we'll be wrapping things up here shortly. So take this time and share uh, what God's done in your heart, hearing Jim's story, God's story in Jim and, and what, he's, what he's speaking to you right now.
no confusion The darkness can never hide Your resurrection The power that lives inside Jesus, I am strong I only wait for two The gospel is freedom We live and we breathe To surround my heart, I have found the same place to fall apart. Things will pick me up again, remind me to fool I belong. I am not a babe, more than a child, and no arms, and you will hold me. I don't. 
All right, men. Uh, it's fun. I can see the screen and all the breakout rooms uh, joining back in. That is, uh, it's pretty cool. Well, men, has it been a powerful morning? Has it been an, an encouraging and refreshing morning? Give me a thumbs up or give me something I could see. Uh, awesome. Love it. How about guys here? Yeah, I see lots of thumbs up. God is faithful, isn't he? Remember, we started this morning talking about his invitation, his invitation to each one of us. He says, come to me, all you who are wearied and burdened, and I will give you rest. He doesn't say I might, or I could, or I should, or if you do this, I will give you rest. He says he will. He is faithful. Um, he is always faithful to do that. Guys, just a couple of, of things in closing I was struck this morning as listening to Eddie and Ben's story, um, hearing that the beginning of their journey to forgiveness and reconciliation started with an invitation. Uh, Jeff Kirby, right? The guy at the gym uh, invited Eddie. Collins is the one who reached out to Ben. The fireman, right? Jim Pennington, the fireman reached out to Jim and invited him. So guys, you, you may be here today because someone tapped you on the shoulder. Someone invited you, maybe today, maybe sometime in the past. But there are guys out there that are waiting to be tapped. And listen, it's not our job to figure out what's going to happen after we tap them. It's our job to tap them and invite them and basically tell them, hey, this is what the Lord's done for me. Come on along. I want to get to know my Heavenly Father better. Come on alongside of me. I think you've heard that theme this morning, you know, from Ben, Eddie, Jim, and others. Um, guys, we need each other. Uh, we are not meant to walk through this life alone. I think that's one of the enemy's principal strategies in life is isolation. He, he wants to keep us in isolation. So therefore, I, I don't know if he's behind the, well, certainly behind the COVID thing in some ways, but right, we, there is a tendency to isolate. And we got to resist that urge. That's why this morning is so beautiful that we get together. But I would encourage you, if you are not connected in a journey group um, with other men who are seeking a deeper relationship with the Father, uh, go for it, guys. You, you will never regret it. Um, that's, it's, it's very simple. The journey is a process. It's not a Bible study. It's a process of growing in your intimate relationship with your Heavenly Father. And that's the game changer. When, when we're walking with him, when we're influ under, living under his influence, everything changes. So if you're not, I encourage you to talk to someone here at your table or grab someone and say, hey, how do I get connected with uh, Journey with influencers? They will help you do so virtually if you're out there. Um, send Phil Van Horn a uh, chat. Just chat to him and say, I want in a journey and we will get you connected. We have virtual journey groups that meet. So even if you're not near one geographically, um, we, can, we can get connected and stay connected. I'm gonna close this in prayer. Gary, is there anything else that, uh, that I'm missing? Okay. Next weekend, surrounding the city of Bakersfield in prayer, uh, Gary will be sending out information for that. So would you guys join me? in uh, thanking our Father for this morning. Mm. Abba, Daddy, you are good to us. You are gracious and kind and compassionate. Mm. You love us so much. Your faithfulness 
stretches through all generations. We see it. We've heard stories of your exploits of grace in men's lives. We, we know them because we've experienced them in our own lives. Lord, help us to be full of gratitude, to be thanking you. And as Jim said, to let our obedience flow out of a heart full of thankfulness. But let our thankfulness also uh, propel us to reach out to others because everyone needs you. They're hungering and thirsting for a relationship with you, even if they don't know it. So, Father, we thank you for this morning, for refreshing us. Would you stir us up in your son's name? Amen. God bless, men. <laughs> no, we're not. No, we're not. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Phil. Thank all you guys, especially you, Franco. I love you, man. One guy's in his yeah. car. Yeah. One guy's on his phone. Love you guys so much. So good to see you. Ah, man. Thank you so much, guys. It never gets cold.